Hi, and welcome. Uh, I'm here with Matthew. Um, I'm going to introduce him to, and this is the talk, uh, what, can, what Nix can do. Uh, so what is Nix? What is NixOS? You heard of it. What does it actually do? The answer is everything. Using Nix, we can reproduce anything, anywhere, anytime. Bringing ancient ham radio packages back from the dead, cross-compilation to any foreign architecture, including bootstrapping the compiler itself, isolating packages from each other at runtime, building OCI images, building embedded Linux Im system images, deployments, you name it. Nix can do it. Some have even taken to calling Nix the art of containers without containers. In this talk, Matthew will demonstrate all of what he's learned and show you what Nix is capable of in a live interactive demo. You can take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up at, your, at the shell and believe whatever you want to believe, continuing to run installers, mutating your system in a blissful ignorance, not questioning whether, perhaps, your package dependencies are incomplete, accepting that one version is more than any person ever needs, never worrying how to get here all over again. You take the next pill. You stay in Wonderland. And Matthew will show you how deep the rabbit hole of reproducibility goes. Yeah. And without further ado. Can you hear me? Yeah? yeah? OK, fantastic. OK, so Nix is big. And it can do everything. So I'm not going to be able to get through all of it today. But I'm going to be looking at my notes, and I'm going to try and get through as much as I know. And there might be a bit of interactivity. And feel free to raise your hands and like, ask questions and things during the talk. I'm not going to go on forever. A lot of this is going to be interactive, uh, demo-based. So yeah, it's just interactive little tutorial, almost. So what can Nix do? Ah, well, who am I first? Why do you care what I have to say? Uh, so I run NixCamp, which is a training event that runs every year. And my name is Matthew Krogan. And I like using Nix because I started off with Nix uh, by using things like Docker first and realizing that um, it wasn't very reproducible. Um, so yeah, I started with an embedded Linux company. And they were using Docker in their pipeline. They would tell people not to use the Yocto or build root based build systems because that was too difficult. And they gave them Docker files instead. So we made our own little platform and told them to just look at the Docker file, make a Docker file that does a thing, make a Docker compose file that does a thing, and we'll run that for you when the device boots. And before long, this just got ridiculously complex, and uh, it was crumbling. And I decided to go and do Nix instead. So that's my Twitter handle if anyone wants to go and look at it. So yeah, this, this is the, the, the pictures of NixCamp, uh, which we run every year. It's a lot of fun. You can check the blog post out at nix.how slash blog, and then the URL that you've got there. So here's a short history of Nix. Where does Nix originate from? The first Nix commit was by Elko before the thesis came out. In 2004, the first papers on Nix were released then the Nix thesis in 2006. Nix OS was instantiated in 2006 as well. And let's jump ahead to when I got involved in 2021. So in 2021, we had 1,700 contributors and 290,000 commits. Next year, we had double that, or a little bit more. And in just like a month between that last bullet point in 2022 there, we now have 5,000 contributors and 460,000 commits. So that's quite a rate of change. So who uses it, and do you know any of these people? I mean, Target's pretty obvious. Um, Arm, of course. Arm uses it for their hypervisor that they're making, called um, Icicle, I think it is. Yeah. And um, IOHK, Andrill is a military company. And Repolit, of course. I've seen a few people here walking around with Repolit shirts on. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So these are the people who are brave enough to say that they do use it today. But a lot of companies actually view it as a competitive advantage and won't tell you that they use it which doesn't work in their favor, because then they can't find any talent to do Nix. Um, so the former Docker VP, uh, James Turnbull, 
funds a company called Flox. And the GitHub CEO, Thomas Domke, also uh, funds that company as well. So that's a Nix-based startup that recently raised a few million. And the network here, of course, is running Nix. It's only 9% Nix. <laughs> it's not a secret, trust me. So, so, uh, so the repo's on GitHub. Anyone can take a look. And we've only got 9% Nix now. And, and the repo's got a lot of legacy in it, a lot of Ansible, a lot of old stuff. But uh, yeah. Um, it's running Nix now. So what does Nix actually achieve? These are the buzzwords that get thrown around, right? A lot of things claim to do this, but do they actually? A YAML file that I have in a repo doesn't tell me enough information to reproduce anything. Nix actually achieves real infrastructure as code, and it achieves real behavioral reproducibility of components, right? It also achieves software supply chain security and auditability, and it allows you to make an SBOM for your dependency chain. And a lot of people forget this, but Nix is actually just an executable. Right? It's a, it's a C++ program. I can give you it. I can statically link it. And you can reproduce everything that I've done with my Nix code on your machine. And it's only around 20 megabytes. I can send you that file. You can mark it as executable. And you can do Nix build. Nix is also a programming language. So Nix is the program that evaluates the Nix code in the same way that Python might evaluate or interpret the, uh, the, the Python code in .py files. But Nix is also a package manager as well, and it has features for, I don't know, just saying like Nix shell, and I'll get a program temporarily just for the moment. And it also uh, has this trend of compiling things from source. You don't have to, but this is the large trend in Nix, is that you want to compile things from source. So what's Nix Packages? Nix Packages is a collection of 90,000 packages now. Right? So this is where all of the recipes come from. We call them derivations. This is the Nix code that reproduces Python and glibc and Firefox and builds everything from source. If this didn't exist, I couldn't Nix build anything. Okay. So it's just a repo on GitHub. And it contains these 90,000 plus reproducible recipes. And it is automated as hell. There's bots everywhere running rampant and automatically doing everything. Some people on the IRC channels don't even know when they're speaking to a bot. They'll say, why did this person do this? But then they find out later that it's actually just a bot that was automatically commenting or uh, providing a review. And we'll, we'll see some of that later. So uh, this is kind of hard to see on this uh, display here. But at the top right is Nix Packages Unstable. And at the bottom left, it looks like we've got uh, OpenSUSE and Slackware. Right? So this is a graph of freshness and size. So on the top right, that means that you've got more packages, and they are more up to date. On the bottom left, the opposite is true. And Ubuntu is in the middle somewhere. So what is NixOS then? So we've defined Nix, Nix packages. Nix OS is something that is built from those two things. So it's built from the Nix language and the Nix packages collection of recipes on GitHub. And I can define my own Nix OS with my own stuff in it, my own behavior. I can say, I want to enable Firefox, and I want to enable like Node-RED or Grafana. And then I can do a Nix build on that Nix code. And it will result in something that, if I run it, will make all of that true. So therefore, it's completely declarative, like Ansible or Chef want to be. Right? And the reason I use Nix is because anyone should be able to compile my code. That's it. There should never be a case where you can't compile something on your machine, but it works on my machine. It's the same, the client is the same as the server. It's like Git, right? If I git push or git pull it, like the server's not doing anything special. It's the same as the client. And that Nix brings this approach to package management. CI should be the same as my laptop. And they shouldn't need to have knowledge of how my code was built. They should just be able to build it without looking at a readme. 
And if it's broken on my machine, it should also be broken on your machine. Nix wants to break everything, but it also wants to make everything work as well. And this is why we need Nix. If things were simple, we could just go the old way and just do things in the traditional Unix manner, put something in slash bin, and then when you get a new version, replace it. But software isn't that simple anymore. So we need Next because software is this complex. On the bottom right is actually a figure from the Nix thesis written by Elko Dolstra. And that's the dependency graph of Firefox. And I'm not sure what it is on the bottom left, but it looks really complicated. Is it? Yeah, it, so it's Jupiter, someone says. So, did you? <laughs> yeah. So, what do I do with Nix? I just define all my systems in it. And you can look at all of my systems, and you don't need SSH to see what users I have because it's all defined in code. Every element of my system, the way it behaves, the way that my laptop is, the way that my phone is, the way that my servers are, I run a mail server this way. It's all in GitHub public for everyone to see. And I also have just recently started this project called Nixified AI, which aims to make running AI software, this new ecosystem of open source AI, easy to run with a single command. So there's no reason that it shouldn't be that simple. It's just that the dependency chains are so complex, you need something to manage it. And that's what Nix is. So this is a, a, a tool called Invoke AI, which is like an alternative to Dolly. And you can just Nix run this anywhere, and it will work as long as you've got an NVIDIA GPU on the host machine. So if you run that command, whether it's in the Windows subsystem for Linux or if it's on a real Linux machine, it will have access to the GPU. It will compile everything from source that it needs to. But it will also be cached at the same time because I've already built it pushed it to a cache. And then the Nix client just says, that guy's already built it. And then it pulls it because I've already built it. But if my infrastructure disappears, they can still build everything from source. And this is the first image that I made with it. <laughs> because Ken Thompson, of course, is the hero we need, but not the one that we deserve. So what are people saying about Nix? Doman seems to think that we're going to disrupt and commoditize a lot of markets and products. I'm definitely here to make that happen. This guy says that the same place Amazon was conceived made a new, new startup called Flux. Mitchell Hashimoto says the problem with Nix is that when you use it, you lose touch with other people's realities. And the National Archive like Nix, because it helped them reproduce an old version of MySQL that you could never get compiling from source in any other way. And look, Perkins likes it because he only needs one tool now. He doesn't need all of these tools anymore. He can do it all with Nix instead. So this is where the presentation kind of ends because Unfortunately, no one can be told what Nix is. You have to see it for yourself. And that's a picture of Elko Dolstra holding what we call a Nix pill, which when you swallow it, you will never see the world in the same light ever again. <laughs> so if anyone's got a laptop, they can just SSH into this, and they'll be given a virtual machine, whether it's on your phone or whatever. right? You just SSH into that. The password is I hate Nix, and then you get a reproducible virtual machine. And I'm going to show you what that would look like now. Hoping that it's up, by the way. If too many people connect, it will crash. So uh, be careful. This is all running locally at the conference. Yeah. The password is I hate Nix. I'm about to uh, type it anyway. So. So if I click Enter, if type I hate Nix, I'm going to get a reproducible virtual machine, right? Anyone can do this. 
and you'll all get a, your own VM to play around with Nixon. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to show you is how Nix works from a high level, and I'm going to come down because Nix is kind of a high-level tool, and everything it does is quite high-level. So I don't want to go low-level up because you'll never understand it. But if you just understand what it does, alternatively to things like apt, Pacman, traditional package managers, you might get a, a greater understanding. So like I said, Nix is a package manager, so and it's also a language. So I can go into a REPL. I can say load Nix packages. But what is Nix packages? What is that? It's a path. So let's see what's inside of it. And it's got a readme in it. And it's got the contributing MD. So that must be the same thing that we looked at earlier. It's this repo on GitHub. Okay, all of those recipes. So let's do that again. Let's load Nix packages, which is just a path to that place. And let's say Python 3. Python 3 is a derivation. And we're now evaluating that derivation. And it tells us that that is the, the path, the hash of the derivation. So if we say that we want Python 3 of a slightly different version, it's still called Python 3, but the hash is different. So we know that something must be different about the inputs. We know it's different. And this allows us to have 6, 7, 8, 800, doesn't matter. However many versions of Python 3 with different packages available to us, we can have all of them at the same time. So just because it's cached and um, it'll be faster, I'm going to go and SSH into my machine at home in the UK. It'll be a bit laggy, but it's going to be faster to show off the presentation. So I'm going to load next packages here as well. I'm going to type python 3 with and I'm going to tab complete that with my tab button. And it exists. But if we actually go all the way back to the period, it says that we've got lots of like nice uh, functions like in any language. And we can go with programs. And that's, um, oh, with packages. And that is a, a function. And it needs some arguments. The first argument we're going to pass is another function. Inside of p is all of the Python libraries that you could possibly want. So p list p.numpy. This right here is an instance of Python 3 with access to NumPy. And if I put Jupyter in its place, that's an instance of Python 3 with Jupyter available in its path. And I can build them both. I can say, let's build that one with Jupyter. And let's build this one with NumPy. And let's exit. I don't have Python in my system. I don't want it. Never works. <laughs> I don't want pip in my system either, but this has just allowed me to eliminate the need to have them. So this one, this expression, this Nix expression, and inside this, this derivation output, we have uh, all of the traditional FHS paths, file system, hierarchy, standard, directories like slash bin, slash etc, slash include, slash lib, etc. Right? And this Python can import NumPy. It can't, oh, oh, it's unexpected. Maybe I got it the wrong way around. Let's do that again. Let's, uh, oh, sorry, that was the one with Jupyter. I, I mixed it up. Okay. So this one can access Jupyter. but it can't access NumPy, right? And if we do that REPL again, load next packages, Python 3.with packages, a function, p, and then a list, p.numpy, this will yield an instance of Python that has access to that, so let's get in. This one can import NumPy, but it can't import Jupyter. Right, so we've got isolation, but we didn't need special kernel features for this. We don't need containers for this. Right. So yeah, that, that's just a, a quick demo of uh, isolation without the need for containers. So I noted that Nix puts everything in an absolute path in the Nix store. Right, that slash Nix slash door slash hash 
and then the program name, right? That allows us to have any amount of any program that we want, no matter how complex. Um, let's have a look at my next door. Right? This is many gigabytes of every instance of my system that I've had over the, the past few months, right? And I can do a garbage collection on this because my system no longer refers to these, these old paths anymore. So the Python that I have now is not the same hash as those old Pythons. So I can just get rid of stuff over time. Whereas on a traditional system, you might have Python 3, and you might install another Python 3, and you might install another Python 3, and things get left around, nothing works, and the system gets crufty over time. But in Nix, I can just do a Nix collect garbage, and it'll start deleting all the things that are no longer referenced in my system. So the things I'm not asking for get removed. I'll show you a bit more of what I mean about that. So in this micro VM, since we have it, this, uh, this thing that we can all SSH into if we want it, I'm just going to show you what it looks like in NixOS to deploy a service. Typically, I have a, uh, a configuration.nix, and if I do con vim configuration.nix, I'm not going to have vim, so I just need to get vim real quick. So we'll get vim real quick, and it'll bring in all of the dependencies of vim that we need. Um, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so we're going we're to express some of that. So the question was, can I declare a kernel, like a whole Linux kernel with different patches and different things, just as easily as I am saying I want Python 3, right, with these libraries installed? And the answer is yes, and we're going to look at some of that. So... Yeah, so every, every input to them, the source code, everything ends up in that hash. So if the source code changes, the hash is different. If one of the dependencies changes, its hash is different. If one of the dependencies source code changes, it's all this recursive function. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So let's do a simple thing and enable a web server, right? Services.nginx.enable equals true. And then we'll do a Nixos rebuild switch. And what I asked for is going to become true. And if it needs to, it will compile Nginx from source. But it doesn't need to because it's going to look up, has anyone else built this yet? And if they have, then it will just pull it from the trusted third party, which in our case is the NixOS infrastructure, cache.nixos.org. Okay. Ah, this is running on the scale Wi-Fi, so it may not be so fast. <laughs> Oh, uh, not yet. <laughs> right. So uh, I guess in the meantime, whilst this is doing its thing, we're going to define a Raspberry Pi image, OK? Because I'm bored. I've got nothing else to do. So let's look at some of these examples here. So this Raspberry Pi Nixos example, I've got a configuration.nix. I've, I've put a lot of other boilerplates in here to make this work so simply, right? But this configuration.nix here, right? I can say what I want this Raspberry Pi that's in front of me to look like when I boot it off the SD card, right? I'm going to be able to build an embedded operating system just from this code that you see on screen. So on my Raspberry Pi, I want to, like, I want to enable like GNOME. I don't want to have a GNOME desktop. So I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to say, how do I do that? Nixos, GNOME. Huh? All right. Oh. So. This is how you enable an X server and tell it that you want to use GNOME and GDM. And again, it will compile all of those things from source if it needs to. So let's add that to the config. And then let's say that we want to put Blender in the system packages and run Blender on the Raspberry Pi. Not sure if the GPU will handle that, but let's give it a go. Okay. And let's also say that we want it to be connected to the scale Wi-Fi. So Networking.wireless.interfaces, yeah, yeah. Um, what is it? Scale? Uh, sca 
Okay. Scale public fast. And the password is penguins. All right, my username. Yeah, I'll just keep it like that so you can see that it actually works. And SSH is going to be on. And let's next build dot hashtag tab tab images dot pi. And that let's let that chug along for a bit. And it says, well, we can't do that because GNOME uses Network Manager. So it prevented us from making a bad image that we would have to debug and test because it failed at evaluation time in the Nix code before it even hit the device. Okay, so let's say networking dot, we don't want to use network manager, dot enable equals false. And now we're going to make an embedded image that doesn't have network manager, but does have all the things we've asked for. Okay, so that's going to churn away in the background. Again, this is all running on my laptop. And it says Blender's broken on ARM64. So that's just great, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I think FreeCAD works. Uh, let's, let's give that a go. How's our micro VM doing? Okay, so Nginx is available. And we can see that Nginx is available here. But what about something more complex than a web server? Well, has anyone ever heard of the password manager Bitwarden? Let's go and deploy that. Um, I'm just going to go copy it from my existing Nix config because this is also a trend in the Nix. You can just copy paste code from other people's configs. Everything's portable and shareable and reproducible. So I'll just copy that. And if it needs to, again, it will compile Vault Warden from source and everything it depends on. Rebuild switch. How's our image doing? So it's, right now, it's actually pulling all of the dependencies of FreeCAD and GNOME and things like that. And it looks like it's going to download 411 me megabytes, and that's going to extract to 2.4 gigabytes, um, of which seven jobs are being worked on, seven derivations, seven recipes are being built. Um, yeah. Oh, no, sorry, that's three are being built. Six are being fetched from the internet. Yeah, so you get like a nice progress bar and stuff like that. In the meantime, let's have a look at what other demos we got. Yeah, container images, okay. So if you need to, you can actually build a Docker... <laughs> <laughs> if you need to, you can actually build OCI-compliant images with Nix, which is a better alternative to a Docker file, because a Docker file might say at the top of it, from Ubuntu, latest which guarantees that the next time you're on Docker build, you ain't going to get the same result. OK, so let's push it to a registry and put a hash on it. Doesn't matter because it's like from Ubuntu and then a hash, but you can't actually reproduce the Docker file that built that. You just got a golden image. You've got a gigabyte lying around. True reproducibility is when you only need to store one kilobyte to reproduce one gigabyte. You've got the build instructions in a text file, then you do a build on it, and then you get the one gigabyte that you were expecting. Right, so uh, that's what Nix kind of achieves. Right, Nix OS configurations. That's when you can declare things, just as I have here. Right, so Vault Warden is up. So let's go to it. Looks like it's on eight two two two. Um, I'm going to use bore to tunnel in. This is like an alternative to Ngrok. Uh, And we'll get back a port number. You guys can all hit this if you want. And you see that Bitwarden's there. But doesn't that make state and stuff? Like, doesn't that make files on the disk and it's nasty stuff? I can just get rid of the majority of what that just did by commenting the code out, right? I'll just comment it out. And then I'll do a rebuild switch. And everything that's related to that component, Bitwarden, is going to disappear. All of the users, all of the systemd services, everything's gone. And if I want to bring it back, then I just put the code back. Nix turns an operating system into nothing more than an executable program, in the same way that you would get C code, and you would compile it and then run the binary. It's just turned my whole operating system into that same thing. Modifying a file in ETC manually with Vim is like a go-to. It's harmful. You should have programs generate these files for you, especially considering it's so complex these days. And there is no standard. 
There is no standard configuration format, which is why we need something like this. So Vault Warden's gone. All the services are gone. And everything's cached in the, in the slash next slash door. All the objects we wanted are all there, right? All the paths. So we bring it back by uncommenting it and doing a rebuild switch. It's going to come back much faster this time. It doesn't need to do anything. All of the build outputs are, uh, are, are in the next door already. It's all cached. So how's our Raspberry Pi build doing? Uh, well, it's building the X4 file system image that I'll flash to the SD card with DD shortly, and then I'll pop it into the Pi, and then I'll show you it all uh, through OBS. And it should pop up with GNOME, and then when GNOME pops up, I should be able to run FreeCAD. And all the things I've defined should be true. All right, so what else have we got? Raspberry Pi, flakes, okay, yeah, flakes. So have you ever had an experience with your colleagues where they're running something completely different from you and they can't get the same results as you. Like, they're running an old version of NPM, so when they run NPM, they get a different result, right? Well, let's fix that. So I think I'm gonna do everything as a simple flake. A flake in Nix is something that has all of its inputs and outputs defined clearly. So I'm saying that I want to go and get Nix packages, that repository of, recipe, and recip, of recipes, um, 90,000 of them, which includes .NET, Java, anything you want, Postgres, any, any program you want to build from source, we can do that. So let's define a dev shell for the x86 architecture. And let's give it an argument. MK shell is a function from Nix packages, which is going to be given one argument, build inputs. That's going to be a list of packages that we want to give someone reproducibly. So let's say in here some unlikely things, right? And by the way, if you want to know what packages are available, you go to search.nixos.org and you'll be able to browse them all, right? So let, let's say JRE, the Java runtime environment. Or what about the JDK? Okay, so it's called JDK. Packages dot, um, dot net. This will never work. Uh, um, what else is unlikely? Um, I don't know. I think that's probably enough, isn't it? Has anyone got any ideas for unlikely packages? Uh, yeah, that wouldn't work. Something that's really difficult to install. What's that? VBA. Open CV. Let's get Open CV. ECC. ECC. No, EC. Doesn't look like anyone's bothered with that. <laughs> okay, so well, this is unlikely enough, right? So packages.opencv, right? It's going to have to compile some of that from source and fetch it. So we do a next like show on this. It's going to download next packages and then it's going to extract it. And in fact, this is so slow, I might just copy it to my main machine back home. Let's do that. Um, yeah. Just wormhole send flake.nix to my remote machine. Cool. Let's do a Nix flake show on this. Okay, it's already got that version of Nix packages. It cached it. Let's Nix develop on this dev shell. It needs to download 481 megabytes, and it's going to extract it to 1,150. And we're going to get the OpenJDK. We're going to get the Java uh, stuff. We're going to get .NET, and we're going to get OpenCV. And it, anyone who runs this command, regardless of where they run it, what laptop they run it on, are going to get exactly the same version of all of those things. Right? And that's really what Nix is about, is about making sure that everyone gets the same version of everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, so um, uh, like I said, I've got to look at my notes from time to time. It's just too much, you know, it can do everything. So let's take a look at the old way of doing things. So if anyone liked Resident Evil, 
there was an old game called Outbreak on the PlayStation 2, but the PlayStation 2 is old hardware. It's got old open SSL ciphers in it. So you've got to compile in order to run this reverse engineered server for this old game that someone's uh, reverse engineered. Uh, you have to compile Apache with an old open SSL and link it. And these are the instructions to do that. Let's get started. So the first thing to do is to wget the source code, right? And then we extract it, we get in there, we run dot slash configure, we run make, we run sudo make install. Cool, that's probably going to work. But how do we know what the hash of this file is? They could have just changed it, and we wouldn't even know that the contents were different. So that's a mistake. A Docker file will also allow you to make the same mistake, but Nix won't. Nix is a reproducible build system. It's a domain-specific language for defining reproducible builds. So what that means is that it won't allow you to make this mistake. It will warn you. It will say, you, ca you can't just fetch something from the internet without telling me what its char sum is. Right? And so, yeah, so now we've got to compile Apache. So we've got to get these things along with Apache's dependencies. And then we've got to do the same process for all of those things. Right? And that's probably going to work. Right? Um, oh, wait, no, it's not going to work because there's a sudo apt get update, and libpcre3 doesn't exist on my system because no one told me what version of Raspbian he was using. So none of this is reproducible. These instructions are meaningless and always have been. So how does this look in Nix? How do you do the same thing that he's trying to express in Nix? So I packaged it in a flake. And the answer is apache.override open SSL, the old open SSL. That's it. That will do exactly the same thing as his. Okay, that will build me an old Apache. It will link in the old open SSL, and we're happy. So Looks like my build. Oh, wait, no, that's the next develop shell. So now we've got the JDK. Uh, how is it JDK? Uh, I don't even know what the uh, Java C. Cool. So we got, we got that. So everyone's going to end up with the same version of Java C, compile from source if it needs to be. If all of the infrastructure of NixOS disappears, you'll still be able to reproduce all this from source. Great for disaster recovery, right? You don't want to be left on Mars without the ability to build from scratch, right? Yeah, the Docker Hub's down. <laughs> OK, so uh, what, what else did we get? We got OpenCV underscore version. There we go. And we got the .NET. There we go. So we got all those things. But the moment that I exit the shell, it's all gone. I don't have the I don't have uh, OpenCV underscore version anymore. I don't have .NET. So it's clean as well, because I don't have a lot of cruft lying around on my system, and I have to factory reset it. Nix and NixOS remove the need for factory reset. You don't need to do that anymore, no matter what state you're in. Right? Um, OK, how's our image doing? Still building that Z standard uh, flashable image. Almost done, though. It's uh, doing a lot of checks to make sure that the, the data actually was correct. Uh. Oh, uh, yeah, so actually I'm doing something called binary format uh, registration in the Linux kernel. So I'll show you what that looks like. So in fact, let, let's just get into cross compilation, OK? So if I want to cross compile a program in Nix, all I have to do is say nix build, nix packages, hashtag packages cross dot tab. And we'll be able to see all of the different architectures that we can compile for. And if I want to compile for risk 5 I just say packages cross dot risk 564 dot the name of the program because we've got every nix package, all 90,000 of them instanced with their cross compiler flags adjusted for what we want. So Let's say hello world. I built that last week, so it's cached in my next door. But if we wanted to rebuild it, we just do this, and it will actually compile it all from source again. Right? This is compiling, cross-compiling hello world. Um, and then I, 
if we look at the results of that, we can see that it's a dynamically linked RISC-V executable. But my kernel is x86, but I can run it thanks to this thing called binary format registration. Right, it will spawn QMU as a user in user mode in order to run the program and provide the standard output to, to me. And uh, in Debian, it's really complicated to do that. So let's have a look at how you would do that in Debian. Um, I've got, a, I've got um, a project called NixBlitz, which is like uh, Bitcoin nodes and things that references this. So in order to do that same thing on Debian, you would have to do this. You'd have to apt install bin FMT support and QMU user static, and then you'd have to do this, and then you'd have to do this, and then you'd have to do this, and this, and this. And it's like, I can't do that. You know, I don't want to do that because I might screw something up. But on Nix, and I'll show you this now, on the micro VM that we've got running, I'll Nix build Nix packages, hashtag packages cross dot risk564.hello. And whilst that's doing its thing, um, I'll just show you the line of code that I've got in my config that does this. So on my T480, which is my laptop, I just say I want bin FMT emulated systems to, I want to emulate these architectures and it will go ahead and it will compile QMU from source in order to perform the function that I want, which is to emulate systems at runtime. So I can emulate all of those architectures just because of this one line of code on my NixOS machine. And due to bandwidth, I can't really show you it that fast on this machine, but I'm just trying to multitask. Um, but they, these are real demos, right? Like there's, there's, there's no limit to what it can do. You know, uh, let's just take a look around my config, you know? It's like, I say, um, I want my firewall to allow these ports. That's how I do it. I say, this is what I want my host name to be on the network. I want to use systemd network D, and I want this behavior on my wireless interfaces. And if I want to see what's available to mess around with in Nixos, I just go to search at nixos.org and type like uh, bin FMT. What does it do? extra binary format, binary formats to register with the kernel. And that will implement all of what the Debian documentation specifies here, except I don't need to read any of it anymore, and I don't need to know how it works. I just want to emulate that architecture. Someone has given me 20 years of Unix experience for free, right? Um, I guess we can go back in time and like, reproduce a really old version of MySQL, just like uh, Determinate Systems did. Okay, so git checkout, NixOS, um, 18.09, Nix REPL, load the current directories, Nix code, and we should have access to like MySQL and stuff. And the version it's at is 10.6, that's really old, right? What are we at right now? Um, 10.6.12. I guess it's not uh, that different. <laughs> That's 2018. Holy crap. Okay. Um, Postgres. 14.5. Okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> like, uh, these things don't seem to change that much, do they? But like. We can, we can reproduce anything that we want. Um, let's go back even further. Let's go back to 2013. Oh, that's too old. It's not even, that, well, that was when NixOS wasn't even managed in Git. It was managed in Subversion. But yeah, I'll, I'll just do 2018 for now. Okay. Um, and let's build MySQL. Oh, it's not shown as the log for that, so. Probably, there we go, yeah. So sadly, the cache is so reliable, like it's like a blockchain moving forward, right? Like all of Nick's packages is moving forward in Git. And everything's on cache.nixos.org still, so you don't actually have to reproduce anything if you don't want to. It'll just pull it from the cache. 
Um, so we'll have to turn the substitutors off to prove that that really is doing what I say it's doing. Um, yeah, it's still building the, uh, the embedded image. Ah, right, but we got our RIS5 uh, binary. So let's look at the result. I can't run that, right? But if I just add one line of code to my Nixos config on this little VM that I've given you, bin FMT dot registrations, what was it? I could just man configuration.nix to get the same results uh, as search.nixos.org, emulated systems. And it equals a list of architecture strings. Risk 5, 64, Linux. Yeah, and do an XOS rebuild switch. I'll be able to run that binary after that's done. Okay. What else have we got? Real quick, by the way. Yeah. The, uh, older branches, they, they don't start with XOS dash, it's release dash. Oh, it's release. So I guess we can do that, yeah. Okay, so we got the old, um, we got the old MariaDB. Okay. So let's get checking. Let's check out that really old version of, from 2013, and let's build something. Um, interesting thing about this is that um, this Hello World that we're building won't be able to run on the current kernel because the Linux kernel broke compatibility at some point. So whilst we can still build it, and Nix will actually, it actually puts measures in place in order to, um, to pretend to be an older kernel so that it can rebuild this stuff. So if we have a look at that. We won't be able to run it. That's, that's what happens when you run a really old uh, Hello World in the current kernel. But Nix can still reproduce these things, and that's important. Uh. OK. Ah. Well, we're almost there on the embedded image. It's taken a long time on this laptop. I probably shouldn't have done it. Uh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Rufs XP. This is an old uh, Windows program, but I've made a package for it. I've got a repository on GitHub called Hamnix, and it's not much of a collection yet, but it will be. And if I want to, I can just run this really old Wine program with Nix, like this. And uh, here we go. Right, so yeah. Yeah, so this is like an old wine program. Well, it's a Windows program that runs in wine. And I made a derivation for it so I can just run it. And this will work on your machine the same as it does on mine. And you don't have to configure wine at all. And I even made it. I even made it put the contents of its state in a traditional Unix directory, like dot program name in the home directory. So you can rewire anything with Nix that you want. Um, I've just been reminded, uh, someone asked about the kernel earlier. So there's this thing called Nix OS shell that I'm going to try out now, written by someone again in Nix code. Nix code. Um, and all you really have to do is specify vm.nix, and you can run a VM with the kernel that you want, just the same way that you would define it in a NixOS configuration. Okay. Okay. So what kernel do we want to use? Do we want to use an older kernel? Because we can do that. Uh, you can see that in, in Nix packages, there is a library of, uh, of kernel versions. Oh, I'm in the options, that's why. No? 
Anyone know what it's called? <laughs> oh, here, here they are. So packages, Linux packages. And then you've got all these different kernels, right? You can choose from any of them. And if I, if I want to use an older kernel, I can just say so. So I want, I want kernel 5.5.19. Okay, so let's get NixOS shell, which is a program written by someone else. And let's run NixOS shell. Oh, well, looks like Linux 5.19 wasn't, it doesn't work anymore, so we're not going to use that. Um, 6.2. I can always go back to an older version of Nix packages, though, and get that to work. And I'll show that off in just a moment. I've got a language server in Vim which tells me when I'm not doing things correctly in Nix. So this is going to build a whole uh, virtual machine image and then it's going to boot it with the parameters that I've specified inside. So this has just booted me into a Nix OS VM transparently. Um, yeah. And it's also passed through the current directory into there as well. So it's kind of like, not only is it a Nix shell, it's a Nix OS shell, so you get a whole kernel there. So the kernel here is 6.2, because I asked for it. And again, it would build that kernel from source if it needed to. Um, and the kernel on my host is 6.1.12. And if we modify that again and say we want 6.1, and do a Nix OS shell, it will do that too. Oh, the, uh, uh, it's because I didn't specify the state version in the Nixos config, but I don't, I don't really care about that. Oh, because I didn't specify the version of, uh, like, I'll show you, I can get rid of it, so. Um, System.state version, so you would specify it and then that would remove it. Um, so, again, like, because this is the full Nix OS, I can say, like, system.state version equals 23.05. And I can say services.node.red.enable equals true. I could do the same with Grafana, right? And let's get into that Nix OS shell. Um, the state version prevents moving Postgres versions up. So, for example, if you, define, if you said, I want Postgres on this NixOS, and then you upgrade NixOS, you don't want Postgres to come up with it because that would cause state corruption because the new Postgres may not be able to handle uh, the upgrade. Uh, it, may, it may screw your data up or something like this. So we prevent Postgres from moving up automatically with that state version. So it's up to you to change that number if you want to get the new version of Postgres. Okay, so system CTL, status node red. So node red is running inside of this NixOS shell that we just uh, defined. Um, on. On port 1880. There you go. So node red. Okay, our, our image is done. Let's flash it. Okay, this should be pretty fast. In the meantime, our little micro VM just compiled QMU from source. That's kind of hard to see because of the spam, but we're now going to be able to run that RISC-V binary that we compiled earlier in this micro VM. We run file on it. We see it is indeed a RISC-V executable. Then we run it. We can run it. Well, we didn't have to reboot to do that, right? We're just running the program because the Nixos modules are just that intelligent. Okay. Any questions?
Yeah, so let, let's, let's, uh, let's go on to the next REPL. Uh, the question is, how does the cache.nixos.org get populated with the old GCC, etc.? And the answer to that is a mechanism called binary substitution. So if I say packages.python3.with packages, oh, I need to load next packages first. If I say, oh, on my laptop, python3.with packages, and I give it a list. p.numpy, that hash is going to be different than with Jupyter. So if I bind these to variables, I'm going to be able to inspect them and see what's different about them. x equals that, and y equals the one with numpy. y has this thing called an output path, and that path is what Nix asks for on cache.nixos.org. It says, has anyone got this path? And if they do, then I don't need to build it. But the, this recipe is what determines that hash. I've asked for NumPy. But if I ask for Jupyter, that's not the same thing. It's a different output path. Right? Yeah, so like, I mean, it's going to get complicated at this point because how you compile Python 3 is complicated. But if I go to search on Nixos.org and I click source on Python 3.9, it will tell me how it compiled Python 3.9. It's quite complicated. But usually everything is just a call to this function called MK derivation. Okay? So we say that we're going to MK derivation, make a recipe, and the P name is going to be Python 3. And then we're going to do, we're going to get the source code from here. And it requires bash in the build system, so we give it bash. And we're going to patch it, and we're going to replace some of the strings in the files and stuff. And this is the whole build process encapsulated. In fact, I, I might as well just show you this thing. Um, yeah, that's right. So we have to go back to the old function. So whenever I load the old Nix packages, this file will look very different. But it doesn't matter because it still defines how to build it, and it will be able to fully realize everything. It will be able to go back and get the old dependency tree. Because the dependency tree is in front of us. It is the whole of Nix packages is the dependency tree, and it contains all of the dependencies. And we can build all of the dependencies through time. OK. Um, Let's see if our image is done flashing. And, uh, oh, yeah, I'll show you some determinism warning soon. Uh, OK, so our image is finished. Fl eight, <laughs> it's 10 gigs. So let's hope it was worth it, yeah? Uh, great. So I'm going to put this SD card in the pie. Let's put it in the right way up, I hope. I'm going to go to this screen. I'm going to plug it in. And this is why it's useful for embedded, right? I can just define a Raspberry Pi that I want to exist in theory. And it will blow up before it even gets to the Pi. So it will tell me that I've configured something incorrectly. So the amount of debugging that I need to do is reduced. And then it's going to have the behavior that I specified. I wanted some things enabled. I wanted FreeCAD to be available. I wanted GNOME desktop. I wanted all those things. And it's just going to go ahead and do it. Yeah, so this, this image is going to have Nix inside of it, but you're not really limited. You, you can do whatever you want with Nix, given enough time and energy. You can say, I want to, to use Nix to build a small config file, or I want to use Nix to build an uh, embedded system that doesn't even have like, uh, like an init system. You can just say, I want a process to be there instead. But right now, we've got full Nix OS. Yeah. So my username, my password, that was what was in the template. OK. I'm, I'm this is the full system, and I hope it's connected to the Wi-Fi as well. 
It takes a little bit to launch GNOME on first boot. And there we are on the Pi. Right, we built all of that from source. Uh, uh. Yeah. What is in the package that you're interested in that isn't available on mixbox.org? How difficult is it to make that conversion? Derivation, a recipe, yeah. So, so let me just see if this is connected to the internet, and then I'll get uh, back to you on that. The question was, how difficult is it to build a derivation or recipe for something that isn't already there? And I'm going to show you it in the form of the, uh, the contribution process. So is that connected to the internet? One, one, one. Yeah, it is. So, that, so all of those Wi-Fi rules we defined are in there as well. So. And we have FreeCAD, right? Yeah, FreeCAD's there. But will it work? That's the question. Uh, th this is usually, uh, oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> it might crash on boot, yeah. Yeah. Let's launch it in the CLI instead. I think it crashes because of the uh, memory size on the GPU, actually. I, I think I ran this before, yeah. But that, that's hardware limitations. Nix can't help you with hardware. The only reason a Nix build should fail is usually hardware, so you've got uh, memory limitations and you've got the internet, and that's really the only reasons that things should fail. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, let's uh, check back on that in a minute, see if it loaded. <laughs> so you said, um, how do you package something that's not there? So someone recently, and I was, I was hoping that this wouldn't be closed already, or that someone wouldn't have written a package for it so I could do it on stage. But here's a package request on GitHub on Nix packages for a program called CSV Quote. Okay. And then someone comes in literally hours later and packages it for them. So let's see what my version of this looked like. So this is a, a simple C program. So I just say MK derivation, give it an argument name, give it a version argument, tell it where to get the source code from. Um, and then I have to do these patches because otherwise it doesn't fail the test. So I'll just get rid of these things just so we can build it up, right? This is all that's needed to like compile some basic C code. So if I save this file and do a call package on it, it produces a derivation. We can build that derivation, and the result will go in the next door. But look, it just failed. Why did it fail? Um, Oh, yeah, right, that's right, because the original program, CSV quote, which is on GitHub, the original program has a make file, and the f when you do an install on the make file, make install, it will put it in the binary directory, and by default, the binary directory is slash user slash local slash bin, so we've got to patch that out in order to reproduce this program. So the way I did that was by before we build, I would export that variable so that the makefile operates correctly. Nix is just abstracting things and saying MK derivation is just going to run make build and make install for you. Right? So we give it the source code and it will automatically do all of that in a functional language. So now that we've defined that we want to export this variable, the program is going to work. Right, and produce an output. So that's like a simple C program uh, and how you would build it in Nix. That, that's the recipe right there. Okay. So traditional, I mean, we can look at package requests on GitHub. It's probably not worth packaging one right now, is it? Uh, <laughs> but we could help someone out. TMP Reaper, what does that do? Cleans out temporary files. Where's the source code? It's GPL2. What's it written in? Looks like a simple program. Temp Reaper. Ooh. 
Oh, where's the source code? <laughs> Where is it? Okay, looks like the source code's here. And written in Ruby, no chance. Uh, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, I, I think um, I'd have to sit down with you and you can come and like ask me to like package some of your things and I'll happily package them if you want to see more in detail about how that works. Yeah. Oh yeah, VM tests. I haven't even got to that yet. So for every package in Nix packages, someone may have written a VM test in NixOS tests. And it looks like we've got 643 of them. What do these VM tests look like? They're function calls that spawn numerous virtual machines and then test the interaction between those virtual machines that you've asked for. And you can run the test on your machine, and I can run the test on my machine, and we'll get either the same result. With All we really care about in that is like exit codes. Like, did the program crash or not? So let's run one of the tests. Oh, tab completion. Let's try that again. Sometimes Nix needs to compute things. And I've got a very basic one for Node Red. And it's a function call that looks like this. I mean, this is a bad this is a pretty bad um way of saying it, but you could actually just say um Nix OS test. And then that would usually do the same thing, but they've chosen to do it like this in next packages just because it's like legacy stuff. Um, so it's a function that we pass an argument name and the metadata, like who maintains this test. And these are two virtual machines that we want to spawn with their Nexos configuration in. So if I wanted the clients to be able to ping a Node Red machine, a machine that has a Node Red system D service up and running, I could also say services.mysql.enable equals true. And then that would build me a virtual machine that has MySQL enabled that I could test against. Okay. And then here's the test script. It will start all the virtual machines. It will wait for Node Red to come up. It will wait for the port to be bound in, inside of the virtual machine. And then it will test that curl can actually reach it. So let's run that test. With uh, big logs. Oh, it's cached it in true Nix fashion. So we've got to rebuild that because someone already verified the test. Cached at Nixos.org already built that test. So that's spawning two virtual machines, and I can run that same test on my laptop. And the only difference is the amount of memory we have available, really. Um, yeah, so that, that actually worked. But if I introduce a failure, for example, I turn node red off, I get rid of it entirely. Like There is no config here. And I build that again. Can't rebuild something I haven't built. There we go. That will do the same thing, except this time Node Red's not there for the client to see, so it will fail. And there it is failing. In this case, it's um, it's, it's probably going to hang. Okay. There you go. So that's ran two virtual machines. Except this time, Node Red's not there, and it failed. And you can get more complicated tests. Like I've written tests for libmtp, which is that protocol, media transfer protocol, when you plug the Android devices that you have into a computer when you want to browse the files on them. That library always breaks, so I wrote a test that proves that that library breaks. And uh, now NixOS knows ahead of time when that stuff is broken, and they can fix it uh, by way of a patch or something like that. Um, yeah. Ah, let's let's have a look at how, what a Nix binary looks like when we build it, like what what the what it's linking to. So on a traditional system, and this is the machine back home, and the internet's not great here, but hope this works. Um, if we do which like ls, <laughs> what's that? 
Oh. Right, sorry. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone's got those weird directories. Uh, you shouldn't pay too much attention to them. There be dragons. So if we do like which ls, we'll get a traditional file system path, right? And if we run it from the path, it's fine. And if we do LDD on the path, we'll find that it's linked to other traditional Unix file system hierarchy standard directories. But on NixOS, we don't have much in slash bin. We only have that. And if we do user slash bin, we only have that. And if we do ls slash lib, we don't even have it. So those paths can't be linked to by the dynamic linker. So if we build something on Nix, what does it look like? Uh, let's have a look at our results here. OK. Let's LDD that. Well, it says that in that case, it's not a dynamic ex executable. But let's, let's build something that is like the regular Hello World. OK, so it points to uh, traditional non-traditional paths, it points to slash nix slash door slash the absolute path of the glibc we want, which is very different from a normal system. But people actually forget, again, like I said earlier, that nix is just a 20 megabyte C++ pro program that it can send anywhere. So th this machine is running Arch Linux, a really old Arch Linux as well. So I'm just going to statically compile nix and then send it over to the Arch Linux machine, and then run Nix on that Arch Linux machine and do some of the same stuff that I'm doing here. So this is a, a 23 megabyte file, so it's not quite 20. It's not dynamic executable. And I'm going to just send it over to the Arch Linux machine. OK, that's pretty fast. And mark it as executable. And now this dot slash nix is available to us. And I can do all the same stuff I was doing, like um, oh, well, flakes aren't enabled. Let's, let's fix that, shall we? So it's going to go and do all the same things that it would do on my machine, except it's doing it on this Arch Linux machine, which is not NixOS. It's not Nix. Nix is just a program you can run on any Linux distribution. And you can run it in the Windows subsystem for Linux, and it will work there too. There you go. Although it did find some weird bugs uh, there with Perl and uh, the language not being set. That shouldn't happen, but yeah. Yeah, by setting the, setting the variables. So in Nix, like, it's a very pure environment. Those variables are not set, because on your machine, they're different. And on my machine, they're different. So Nix is not going to set them to any particular value. It's going to give you a, a clean sort of, uh, not sandbox, but a uh, clean environment in which the program is running, uh, which means you can find some pretty interesting bugs in some programs. Uh, a real quick thing, like because of Nix architecture, we, got a lot of metadata for all the packages. So for example, hello.meta. Well, we know a lot about it. Uh, Firefox.meta. We know a lot about it. It's got a license, right? We know, we know what it is. Is it free? Firefox is free. Um, zoom, us.meta.free. Dot license.free. It's false. Zoom is not a free program. So that means that we're uniquely positioned to generate something like a software bill of materials. So I made what's called a bundler in Nix here. And you can, pass it, uh, you can pass it a few arguments. You can say, I want to like, use my function on a package from Nix packages, and it will generate you an SBOM for it. So let's have a look at all of the runtime um, license dependencies in Firefox. It created a Firefox report for me. And these are all of the 
uh, licenses involved in Firefox. I wonder if they're all compatible. Are there any interesting programs you wonder whether they're compatible or not, or like what the license stuff is inside of them at runtime? Uh, no? Uh, OK, let's try Chrome. That's an interesting one. Let's see how that works. So in order to do that, that's the fetch Chromium. It's going to do a little bit of analysis. And this is all written in Nix code. I actually didn't write the Nix code. I just copied it from someone else. Um, I made like a neat uh, CLI for it. Okay. Oh yeah, and of course, uh, something that might be confusing people is that the ordering in Nix code doesn't really matter. The, the order in which you put things in the code is not important because it's a functional non-imperative, fully declarative language, right? There's, there's, if I put something above something else, it doesn't affect the output. And uh, we'll, end the, we'll end the talk with, uh, with this runtime report. And then uh, I guess if anyone wants to ask questions, ask me after, or we can get some people up that already know Nix to answer your questions that aren't me. Uh, OK, what's Chromium? So these are all the licenses involved in Chromium. Wow. OK, let's have a look at the word count compared to Firefox. So there's 208 licenses involved, well, 208 programs involved in Chromium. I guess this is really not, uh, not a good thing to test, just the word count of it and 194 in Firefox. But you can start to do this sort of SBOM analysis stuff with Nix if you'd like to because of all that existing metadata. In fact, other people that are not Nix or Nix packages use this, use Nix packages as a, as a, uh, a source of metadata. Um, and there's a few projects coming up that just use Nix packages in that manner without Nix. Um, yeah, I guess that's me. Thank you. Oh, free card. Uh, well, Gnome went to sleep. Uh, no, it's just stuck there. The GPU isn't cut out for this. <laughs> you know, but it tries. Oh, yeah, it says there on the left, cannot allocate memory. So this is a firmware issue on the Pi. Yeah. The socials. Yeah, um, sure. Oh, yes, the talk's still going. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to say as well, like, don't use NixOS. It's a bad idea. Paths we're not supposed to have hashes in them. It's just a terrible idea. We've been played for fools. <laughs> okay, so. The socials, yeah, like if you want to contribute to Nix packages, it's the easiest thing in the world to contribute to, right? You just make a file, you put it in the repo, and then you say, I package this thing, and we go from there. And there's 5,000 contributors. That, that's like a big project on GitHub, it's like a massive project. So yeah, get involved. And um, we've got a discourse forum, discourse.nixos.org, which is getting more and more traffic every single day. Yeah, question. Oh, right, yeah, that, that, that's a really good one that we did uh, just in the knock earlier. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, something to do with Monado, OpenXR, etc. cetera. Um, okay. I don't even know where it was. Man. I've put it in my directories. Uh, oh, no. Um. 
Um, right, I'll, I'll just show you a very basic one, right? So let's go to Nix packages and let's get like um, Mosquito, right? Which is an MQTT broker. In Nix, if we want to override something like any of these attributes in purple, like the P name, the version, the source code, where the source code comes from, all we have to do is specify it in an expression. So let's go to our flake here that we've been building up throughout the presentation. So we got our dev shell from earlier. Let's just get rid of that dev shell and say x equals packages dot the thing we want to override, dot override attributes. Put the old stuff in here. And then we can redefine any of those attributes that we want. For example, we can say the source code for Mosquito comes from somewhere else. So we just copy this and replace the bits that we want. And the language server is going to happily tell me that we've got, not got these things defined. So we'll say packages.fetch from GitHub. The repo is Mosquito as a string. And the version is going to come from a different tag of the source code. So let's see their last release. We want it to be v version uh, 2.0.13, right? We want to reduce it by one little small version number. We'll say that we want it to be v 2.0.13. Ah, um, uh, yeah. And we get rid of the SHA256 because we don't know what it is yet. And then we'll do a next flake show here. Oh, we didn't let that run earlier, did we? <laughs> let me um, wormhole send this flake again to my remote machine, which is much faster than my laptop. Yeah, well, let's take a look at that. So it's, it's, it's expressed in the same way. So we're overriding the version number here. Let's build it. And then we'll change the compiler flags afterwards. This is going to build the old Mosquito with the same process. The same build process is going to be applied to the old source code. Right? Now that we got that SHA-256 that Nix gave to us, we know what the SHA is ahead of time. And it's going to build the old Mosquito. It still calls it 1.4, but it's not. We need to change the, we need to modify the version attribute. Okay. So that, that's going to build the, the old Mosquito with the same process. And we can change the C flags if we want to. Mosquito. So you make flags, so we can turn threading off just by saying that we want to the C make flags are going to be the old C make flags added to a new list, which are our new C make flags. My custom flags. So that will now show up inside the build process. In fact, it'll probably tell us somewhere that it wasn't used. Um, if we want to log at that build, we can just say Nick's log on the output as well. So that's, so we can say uh, custom, see, see my custom flags is in the build process there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there, so it's, it's part of the build process now, just by adding it to that functional declared uh, package. So that's like my custom mosquito that I can maintain. 
and I can add flags that I don't agree with. Uh, sorry, I can remove flags that I don't agree with. Um, I, like, I can even say this, like, uh, I could either define a new list that does not contain threading, or I could just say lib.remove this string from the existing list. So it's not the old ones plus my new ones, it's removing this string, this element from the old one. Uh, so we want to say we want the old CMake flags, but we're going to remove that that one. So you can compose and abstract all this stuff in a functional language and make it easier to understand. Um, because I can, I can read that much better than I can a Gen 2 um, e-build file, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a language. It's not just a bunch of variables that get passed around between bash functions, right? Oh, uh, I said earlier that I could inspect some systems without the need to, for SSH, right? So I'm going to show that off now. So if I load my flake for all of my systems, uh, so my name on GitHub, my Nix config. I can say, what have I got here? I've got some Nixos configurations. I've got lots of them. I've got my mail server, I've got my matrix server, my laptop. But what users are on my laptop? Dot config dot, well, let's check if OpenGL is enabled first. OpenGL uh, is hopefully enabled, it is. And I can tell that without having to go through a bunch of file system paths on my system. In principle, this Nix code is going to produce a system with the behavior that I want. So I can just ask it, what is the behavior going to be? So there's less debugging involved. I don't have to go traversing file system paths and looking at what the system at runtime is doing so much. I can theory craft a system in this domain specific language almost algebraically before I even put it on the machine. Right? And I can say what users are in there. So we've got users dot, we've got systemd network, the next build users, Matthew is in there, GeoClue, Avahi. As a result of other configuration that I've got in my system, these users exist. But this is before we even get into running the system. Yeah, it's all static. NixOS is when you go into a system and you can say, uh, oh, where's my micro VM gone? You know what? I'll just spin up another one. So NixOS, the question was, what is NixOS if I can just get the static Nix binary and put it somewhere else? and just use Nix. So Nix itself is a build system, a, a programming language, a domain specific language, um, and a package manager. But Nix OS is something that's built from that in the same way that Arch Linux is built with Pacman, the package manager. So in Nix OS, I can say things like uh, services.nginx enable equals true, and I can re that will become true when I do a Nixos rebuild switch. I can't do that on any other Linux distribution just by copying Nix over. There is a, a module called Home Manager which allows you to achieve some of that because most Linux distributions are systemd based. So I can give you Nix and then you can use Home Manager and then you can kind of have this experience on a non Nix OS distribution. But it's much nicer to be able to have these interactions with the operating system. I can control like the GPU drivers this way. I can control the systemd services that exist. And, and there's a whole like, library right, of those. So search at nexos.org, Grafana. I want to enable Grafana. And these are all the options I have to play with Grafana. I can't do that with just Nix. I need Nix OS in order to achieve that. And that's what the difference between Nix OS and Nix itself. Nix can run anywhere. It can produce the service files. It can produce the config files. But it's not going to put them in place. That's up to you to do. Or 
you can use NixOS, and then NixOS will take care of everything for you. Yeah. The, the answer to the question was, can I use the static NICs and NICs in general on a Red Hat system or an old Fedora system or something in order to play with new packages? Is that right? Or old packages, or old packages like really old stuff that runs on Linux 3 and stuff. Yeah? You can do that? Oh, sure. So let me, let me show you. You just reminded me to talk about Docker for a little bit longer. OK. So, uh, <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that you can use Nix in order to build OCI compliant Docker images and then load them into Docker. But you know, I don't have Docker enabled on this machine. So I'm just going to enable it real quick. I'm going to go into my config for my laptop. And I'm going to put virtualization dot docker dot enable equals true into my config. And then I'm going to Nixos Rebuild switch. And now my laptop is going to have Docker on it in just a few moments. Let's have a look at, because it doesn't have Docker at the moment, right? Like, I'm, I'm just going to make that happen with the NixOS configuration, which is capable of controlling everything. Uh, go ahead, what's up? Oh, yeah, so in, in the virtual machine that we specified earlier, if you just SSH into this machine, you can do Nix minus shell minus P, Vim, and you'll get Vim. Yeah, and I have to Oh, no, I'll show you right now. So we're in the VM. We can just. Yeah, you've got a Nix shell or a Nix env. A Nix env is kind of like the traditional imperative approach of doing apt install thing, apt install thing, apt install thing. And then when you reboot your operating system or install it from fresh, those packages will no longer be there because you failed to write them down. But in Nix, if you just do the totally declarative Nix code approach, you don't have to worry about that. You can just take your packages anywhere and keep everything in a Git repo and stuff. But you have access to this old command, Nix env, which isn't really supposed to be used for anything by people, it's supposed to be uh, a program that is programmatic that you can use in a piece of software that you want to write that interacts with Nix. Uh, yeah, the, the correct way is either to use a Nix shell or to put it in your Nix OS config. Yeah. If you want to keep track of this stuff in Git, right? If you want to imperatively install things and lose that data when you factory reset, then you can use Nix env, but it just depends on what you want. Okay, so we're just about to get Docker installed on my machine. And then we're going to make a Docker container with Nix. Uh, okay, so we got Docker. It's been a very, very long time since I've played with this. So I forgot about like the permissions and stuff. Uh, okay, so let's build a Docker container with Nix. So it's a simple function call to a function called docker-tools.buildImage. And then we tell it what program we want to run as the entry point. And this bit in brackets here is going to be fully built from source and realized. We call it realization when we put paths into the Nix store. It's going to be uh, brought into existence by Nix. So let's choose a more complicated program like Mosquito. Um, So this will fully resolve like this to the following path. It will look something like this. 
when Nix is done evaluating and computing this, it will look like this in reality. Slash. Oh, well, uh, Vim's just tried to load the Nix store paths because of my uh, plugins, so that's uh, embarrassing. Yeah, so, it, so it'll look something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the resolved path. So that thing in purple in the brackets is just a substitution for that. And by saying it in curly brackets, it's actually going to build it from source. So let's build this. OK. So that's going ahead and creating the tarball that we're going to load into Docker. And we're done. So now we've got a path to the next door that has a tarball in it. And if we load this tarball into Docker, And uh, it's going to run Mosquito. So it's like taking it from one runtime to another runtime from Nix to Docker. So we build the software with Nix and we run it in Docker. Because hmm? um, it keeps me in the same directory. Uh, oh, I've never used that before. OK. Yeah. Yeah. What's it say? Punk rock. Oh, yeah, that's another thing I forgot to tell everyone. So Nix is a bit like punk rock. Because the Unix granddads are not going to like it. They won't understand it, and they'll hate it. But the kids are going to love it. How do you run something in Docker again? Was like <laughs> oh, God. Well, it tried to run the program, but Mosquito can't run as nobody, so. Sorry, what was that? Uh, I, am, I could show an example of using Nixos Rebuild Twitch to do that. So let's do that. Um, so I've got my mail server, and I've got a lot of other things in here. What am I going to mess with today? Oh, I, I forgot to mention <laughs> that I build my phone, my Android phone, with Nix in the exact same way. And uh, I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've got a machine called H1, and it doesn't have Docker on it. So I'm going to enable Docker on it by adding to this Nix code here. Virtualization.docker.enable equals true. Right? So a H1 is a machine in my configuration. It's going to take a little bit to evaluate this, but yeah. So H1, Nexos configurations.h1, it, it exists. So let's deploy that to the machine in the real world that exists. So if I SSH into H1, It's going to take a bit because of the internet. Boom. We can see that the current system is some random hash, you know, P6F5. But I'm going to deploy this new one. And the diff is that we enable Docker on line 18 here. That's the difference between what we are on and what we're deploying. So all we should have to do is Nixos rebuild switch minus minus flake the current directory, the name of the machine, and set the target host to Matthew at H1. Should do, yeah. Indeed, that, that seems to be the case. Yeah, that, that will be the case. Uh, although I do have a deployment framework, and I want to use it, because this is, low, this is uh, lower level. But I've got a, a deployment library called Nixonate, which will just let me do the following instead. And it, it just runs Nixos Rebuild Switch. That's all it does. Because this is how I do it, right? I just do Nix run that, and it will copy the Nix code to the remote machine. And then it will use that code to 
do everything. Right? So all it does, and this is the full implementation of the script, is it does nix copy to the remote machine, and then it does a nix slash rebuild on it, and that's it. That's all it does. So shortly, Docker's going to be on this machine. We see Docker's not available yet on this machine that we're deploying to. There we go. So it's getting all the stuff it needs for Docker. A rootless kit, Docker container D. Docker container D still. The, the question was, why would you want to use Ansible when you have this? And the answer is actually on the NixOS Reddit. There is, a question. There is, a, there is an answer to this, so I'm going to show you what the answer to should I use Ansible is. Let's top all time. Ansible. <laughs> Nine Danke. So, uh, where were we? Okay, so Docker is now enabled on that machine that didn't have Docker before. Right? I just deployed it, it's there now. Right? And we see that the current system doesn't have the old hash. So I do a deployment, it copies the Nix code to the remote, it does a Nix OS rebuild switch. Yeah, you can roll it back. Yeah, I can roll it back. The way that I would roll it back is by taking away the code that's managed in Git. So I, take, I get rid of that line, and I do a Nix run on that Nix innate uh, command again. Um, and it's going to be much faster this time. So getting rid of Docker. We've still got Docker. OK, the deployment. And we're going back in time. Docker, Docker. Let's keep running it. And Docker's going to disappear. There we go. Job done. Yeah. And that gets rid of all the users associated with Docker. The group Docker is gone. All the system D services associated with Docker are gone. It's a clean system now. So we can go forward and back. And on my laptop, for example, if I do that same thing, do an XOS rebuild switch over and over again, it creates generations in my bootloader where I can go back. So it's all, it's, NixOS will automatically version it, kind of like Git. You do it, every NixOS rebuild switch is kind of like a Git commit. So you can always go back to the old commit, the old system. Um, garbage collector, old generations. No, because I have a nice line of config, which configuration limit, so I, I don't have to worry about garbage collection because I can say you can, you can only put so many uh, configurations in to the bootloader. It's a function in Next Packages, yeah. Yeah, so that, that function. So, <laughs> Yeah, so the, this is a function that takes two arguments. The first argument is the name, and the second argument is the config. Yeah. 
No, this this uh, this implementation of this does not use Docker. Yeah, probably. Oh. So now we've got packages. We've got Docker tools dot build. We've got lots of other uh, fancy functions and features in here that have nothing to do with building images. Right. Yeah, 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 I can do colony, build it. Nix packages is the library. So that collection of recipes, that 90,000 packages, also contains all of these library functions. Right. So the definition is, is here. Yeah, so like, let me show you some language examples. So in the REPL, if I say x equals 1, y equals 2, I could say y plus uh, x. But I could also make a function. But that's just making values or attributes. Um, so let's say double is a function which takes a single argument. Uh, it already exists as a function now. So. Um, Let's just say add together. And it will take x and y. Uh, and it will add x to y. And now I can give it two arguments, one and two, and I'll add them together. right? But I could also have a, um, an, a parameter set, which is better than this, because this is positional. So sometimes I'll put things in the wrong order. In the, this case, it doesn't matter, but it can matter. So let's say add together set, well, arg set equals an attribute set, which is just curly brackets, um, a equals one. This is an attribute set. A is the attribute, and one is the value of that attribute in the set. So let's say that we're going to take um, first thing and the second thing, and that's a function which adds the first thing to the second thing. Now, we can't just say one and two, because it expects a set of key value pairs. So for example, first equals one, second equals two. And now that will work. Right? Yeah, exactly. It won't matter. Where, where the position of the argument no longer matters. Mm -hmm. So it's like a whole functional language for all of this stuff. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I do. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me think about laziness. Um, Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's hard to find a good example of laziness because in the REPL, the laziness behaves differently. So <laughs> uh, let's see if I can do this. So let's say let in x equals 1. And y equals z in x. You know, the, the re this uh, language server is complaining about y, but I'm not. Uh, will it crap out? <laughs> No, it says undefined still. Um, yeah, I, I can't really give a good example of laziness. I'm not really that familiar with it, if I'm honest. So it's probably not worth asking. <laughs> the build, build image? Oh. Oh, you want to see the implementation of it? OK. 
probably get this file open in a better editor. One sec. Yeah. Well, that, that's why you should get up. You should, you should actually get up and just show people. No. <laughs> One sec, I'll do that in a moment. Uh, so, what did you want to know? Uh, the implementation. Okay, it's quite it's quite a big one. Uh, build image. Augs. Oh God, the return of this is crazy, isn't it? So, <laughs> is it going to use Augs? It's just like a big fat. Build layered image. Oh, okay, it uses run commands at the end. Uh, so, Docker tools build image. It will extract the base image, create the layer, but how does build image get used? No, it's a function. It's a function that when you call it and give it various arguments is uh, going to behave differently. Right, what's up? Yeah. No, it, it can't be running the Docker CLI inside of a derivation. Oh, without, yeah, yeah. It's a really crazy one to debug, though. Yeah, th th this function is incredible. It's like a very, 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 very complex function. It's probably like I don't understand it either. But I'll show you a simple function that can you can you can think about. So we're going to the Nix REPL and load Nix packages. And I do run command, which is a function. It expects a few arguments. It expects a string, name of recipe, slash, or, or derivation, because they're the same thing. Um, empty function call. We don't want to pass any arguments, just use the defaults. And then the command that we want to run inside of a Nix build. So we're going to echo hello to dollar sign out. This is a derivation, and if we build it, it will give us a Nix store path. Yeah, but th this actually ran and built the derivation I asked it to build. It ran hello an echo, sorry, it ran echo inside of a sandbox and then produced an output that ends up in the Nix store. So if I cat that, it now exists and it's got those contents in it. But I could just as easily say, give it some build inputs like um, uh, Firefox minus minus version into dollar sign out and that will actually build Firefox from source if it needs to, give me it and then allow me to run it inside of a sandbox and produce an output from that. So if I build that, it's going to get Firefox, and then it's going to put the results of calling it with uh, that minus minus version in, in the dollar sign out. Although uh, I forgot I need to put, because this is just the path of the next door, it needs to be in bin Firefox. It's inside of the bin folder. Um,
No, it's just uh, it, it currently right now it's taking up bandwidth and actually building something. Yeah, it's not very good at reporting the the status of the build inside the REPL. Really, if I wanted to do this properly, it'd be like uh, I could do it in the command line in a different way. But let, let, let's do it with a smaller program, or perhaps even do it on a machine on a better network connection. Hmm. Oh, maybe that's why the internet seems to have stopped working. <laughs> Is it? OK. All my connections are dead. <laughs> For God's sake, let's get into a micro VM on the local network, which actually works. Oh, and then the, we've got the 80 character limit in QMU. It's not going great, this, is it? <laughs> oh. Let's do a lighter program like Mosquito. Okay. Oh, Mosquito doesn't have the version option, right? But it ran that in the sandbox, right? So minus V. And now we get a, we're probably going to get a build output. That is the result of building that. Hmm, what's happening now? <laughs> all right, all right. Let's stop using the REPL and use something like a file or something. That's going to produce the same result, except we can now build it with the command line. Oh, it's building something with the same DRV. What? Oh, when you launch Mosquito with minus V, it actually spawns it as a demon and it doesn't end. That's, that's what the problem is. Uh, so it actually just ran the, the program as a demon in the, in the, in the sandbox. Yeah, that's correct. It just didn't report anything. It doesn't give me the standard out when I'm in the REPL. It's kind of like a black box when you're in the REPL. So you can do anything. You can... Uh, mosquito, what about... Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's not like systemd. It just allows you to bring any program from Nix packages and run it inside of the sandbox and uh, offline and guarantee that it, the thing that you're running doesn't have access to the internet or any other inputs that you're not in control of. Everything in this file defines uh, where I'm getting stuff from. So I'm getting QMU. It's being built from source. I have QMU. Now I'm going to run it offline in a sandbox. And I want it to give me an output. And it can't give me output that I don't have control over because I've got control over all of the inputs. I control where the source code comes from. I control how it's built. And then I get access to it offline so I can have uh, pure computation. Right now, it, it, I mean, it comes up and down, right? So. GCC right now is at version 11, it looks like. Um. Yeah, you can do that for packages. Um, in fact, I made a nice pull request here that allows you to change every library in the system to use any compiler flag. So if I want to compile every single program and library in my system with different compiler flags, I can do it like this. right? I can say I want every program in my system to use O3, just like this, by adding it to my config. And it will have to build everything from source, so let's do that. Um, uh, 
maybe my big machine configurations. Let's deploy that. Boom. So now every program, it's not going to work because all programs do not compile with these options. They fail, right? So and it's going to copy the next code to the remote, and then it's going to build that. And this is going to take like three days. So. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, next camp will probably run this year. I, I, I haven't announced it yet, so if you want to know more, just go to nix.camp and see the website and stuff and check out the blog post. Right. This guy's like coding a flake whilst eating a flake. It's kind of like, and, and this is the Nick sandbox. It's very secure. Uh, <laughs> some good pictures here. We, uh, the traditional drink of Nick's camp is Nick's and Kicks. We can't get enough of that. Instead of Club Marte, we, choose, we chose this. And this is what the food's like. Uh, at a place in Wales called the Astral Ship. And we had some, uh, some nice times in the quarry and stuff, and like just enjoying nature. And this is uh, the result of an intense RFC debate. <laughs> and what does that spell? Nix. Yeah. <laughs> and then we decided to go up Snowden in flip-flops. Look at some nice pictures. And we, and we did it in our Nick's lab coats as well. So there's a lot of culture going on here. <laughs> a bad culture. Because Nick's is scientific. It's reproducible and deterministic, which is what you want, really, in science. You don't want computer science to stop being science, because then you won't be able to get the outputs that other people do because it will all fail in the middle because someone made a mistake somewhere and didn't tell you what they used on the day that they made the result. And here, here's Rob. Uh, where's he gone? Oh, he's gone. Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. It's not even the end yet. Uh, So in the UK, we have these things called flakes as well. Uh, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's next camp. If you want to come along, just ping me. Yeah. Oh, networking's gone. I don't know what's happened there. I think so, yeah. You got complete control over everything. You have control over the way the kernel's built. There's no, it's not hard to change things. It doesn't take forever, it's cached. With Yocto and Buildroot, if you make a mistake, it destroys your compiler cache. You have to remove all the cache and start again, and it takes forever to evaluate. Whereas this is actually, I, I ran everything today on my laptop, which is not even a modern new laptop. It's, it's pretty old, you know. On my laptop, yeah. It's uh, all Nix OS. Yeah. 